So uh, Thomas Matra is uh, is a PhD student from from the group of uh, Peter Brown and uh, Christoph Mast uh, from Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, Germany. Uh, and the, the group is uh, is doing an exciting work on biophysics of the uh, probiotic origins of DNA and RNA in geochemical settings. So let's see uh, what fascinating topic uh, is he going to tell us about today. Thomas, the floor is yours. We cannot hear you yet. I personally do not hear you, but I do see your screen. Mm, unfortunately, I still don't hear you. Um, Now and oh, that's great. I can ask. Okay, so now you can see my screen and you can hear me. Yes, yes, we do. Perfect. So thanks a lot to the organizers for having me and for the warm welcome. Like I'd like to talk about how heat floats and rock cracks provide a salty habitat for ribozymes that can also help for the fossil problem. So if we think of an early earth. We think, well, there's going to be different salts, for example, sodium, magnesium, and there's going to be a lot of different organic species like nuclear bases, sugars, amino acids, and other molecules. So here I'm going to mostly focus on the salt parts and especially on two um, couples of salts. First of all, sodium and magnesium, where magnesium is necessary for ribosome function, while sodium is most of the time in access compared to magnesium and can inhibit ribosome function. And on the other hand, on the, a part of the phosphate problem where one of the most abundant uh, phosphate minerals on an early earth, apatite, is made inaccessible because of the calcium which uh, chelates and precipitates with phosphate. So this is what I'm going to talk about. So how can heat flows help for those problems? Well, heat flows trigger two different things mostly. If we look at heat in one dimension, so we've got a cold side and a hot side, they're going to push molecules from the hot side towards the cold side. If now to this picture we add gravitation, we'll get a convective role in addition to that. And if we combine those two movements, we get a selective accumulation of species in the bottom right, so in the cold bottom corner. So why is this helpful? Let's, so let's start with um, magnesium and sodium. If we look at typical basaltic rocks, glasses, materials, we find that magnesium to sodium ratios typically range between 0 0.001 to 0 0.1. However, this is not compatible with ribosomes we looked at, where we need more magnesium compared to sodium and especially higher concentrations of magnesium. By adding heat flows to this picture, which would be ubiquitous on Earth and also on early Earth, we can enhance this ratio by up to 1,000 fold. So for example, pushing it to one or up to 100 and thereby making ribosomes work. So how do we do that or what do we look at? So we start off with simple basaltic material, which we put into an Appendorf tube and just as add water to it and then take the supernatant and expose it to such a heat flow chamber where we separate it into three different fractions, which we then analyze by ion chromatography to see where which ion is. Of course, in our experiments, this doesn't look so beautiful, but rather, well, this is still a nice version of it in our experiment looks even worse than that, but like we've got syringe pumps which continuously provide our fluid, which is then exposed to thermal accumulation and selectively 
sucked out by syringe pumps at the top and bottom, which then, which these uh, fluids we can then use to measure the local salt concentration. So if we do that, and we use different flow speeds through the heat flow chamber, we find that the data points are the points, the simulation is, are the lines. We find that both magnesium, magnesium and sodium are accumulated in the bottom fraction. However, magnesium is accumulated up to 2.5 fold stronger than sodium. So why is this important? If we take a simple ribosome, like we took an R3C ligase, and we look at how sensitive is it to both magnesium and sodium. So here I've got the shell lines, probably the graph on the right is easier to see. Like in the dark red line, you've got the case without sodium and different concentrations of magnesium. You see that activity starts at one millimole large, and at four millimoles, you've got a nice activity. However, in typical d shades, we're rather at 100, 200 micromolar of magnesium. If we add sodium, the activity gets worse and worse. And if we go for like salt rich lakes, where it can also reach 1000 fold more sodium than magnesium, activity is close to inexistent. If now we expose the same ribosome together with magnesium to our heat flow chambers, you first of all see that the ribosome also, of course, accumulates in the bottom fraction in the video on the left. But you see that even lower concentrations of magnesium down to 250 micromolar suffice to drive some ribosome activity, which can then, which then even goes further up for higher concentrations. So what about sodium? Well, we then try to combine multiple of those heat flow chambers and just feed the output of the first one into the second one and so on. Experimentally, we stopped it and then extrapolated by simulations. And what you see is that further magnesium is further and further accumulated. And so also the difference to sodium increases over branch numbers. In a more connected network, of course, you'd have influxes of for example, fresh water or other dilute solutions. And thereby you could effectively reduce the sodium content in the solution, even go from 1,000 to one access to one to one after 20 years branches. So uh, with that in mind, we thought, okay, what about phosphate and calcium? So one part of the fossil problem is, of course, as I mentioned before, that appetite is pretty insoluble at physiological pH and only gives away the phosphate at very acidic pH. So there we were eager to see, OK, can we use this to potentially separate phosphate and calcium in the acidic regime and then after reinitialization still get free phosphate? Another part of the problem is that phosphate typically is very dilute in seawater and other solutions. And so one important step would be to see, okay, can we accumulate phosphate locally? So let's start off with appetite. As I said before, this is kind of what we were looking for or exploring. Having the solved appetite then exposing it to our heat flow chamber and then re-neutralizing it and potentially getting away getting out free phosphate. So typically in such porous systems, you have some acidic outflow and thereby could locally dissolve appetite, which for example, here you can see different appetites, more or less fluoride rich, more or less uh, chloride rich, which typically start dissolving at two point something pH or even better at one at pH point. But even if you take those solutions, which at pH 1.5 have 10 millimolar phosphate and re-neutralize it to use it for prebiotic chemistry, you end up with, so this is after neutralization on the right-hand side, you end up with like 100 micromolar, 200 micromolars of phosphate, which is since typically you need 100 millimolar or molar concentrations of phosphate not sufficient. 
So then we took the same uh, dissolved solutions, exposed it to the heat flow chamber, and looked at the bottom part of the output and found that our phosphate to calcium ratio eff effectively is enhanced by up to 60%. So instead of the typical appetite ratio, which, which would be 0 0.6, we go up to one phosphate to calcium. So why is this important at times? After running it through the heat flow chamber, you see from the left-hand side, our uh, phosphate concentration is enhanced by up to six-fold. But also calcium, of course, is enhanced. But as you saw on the slide before with the ratios, it's enhanced less strongly. And so even after renaturalization, we end up with up to 10 millimolar of free phosphate at neutral pH when starting at, for example, pH 1.5 or 2.5. And this phosphate can then be used to, for example, phosphorylate nucleosides to create more active phosphate species such as TMP. If we look at other phosphate sources, so not just appetite, but also different um, basaltic classes, even a synthesized 1% phosphate class, typically leached concentrations don't exceed 100 micromolar. However, if we expose those leach solutions to our heat flow chambers and take the bottom 25%, so not even very localized, just the lowest part, we find up to 100 fold accumulations of phosphate in this fraction. And also, th thereby can locally provide environments with high phosphate content. So, how can we even further include the kind of geological context in our experiments? One part is pH. pH oscillations, for example, those on post about pH oscillations are important in a prebiotic environment and in the past our group could show that with amino acids and more complex solutions you can drive pH gradients in our heat flow chambers. So we found that even simple salt solutions such as sodium chloride solutions or artificial seawater just naturally drives pH gradients up to three units of uh, between the bottom and top fraction. You have one more minute to the end of the talk, but if you wish, you can utilize additional five minutes uh, planned for the discussion. Sorry to interrupt. Perfect. Thanks. Of course, another part is at the moment we use sapphire on both sides of the heat flow chamber in order to really control the reaction environment. However, in a natural setting, you wouldn't have sapphire on both sides. You'd rather have volcanic material. So we're currently working on implementing that and using volcanic glass on both sides. And so far we were able to show that this doesn't hinder neither the ionic nor the pH gradient to occur. In the same stream of ideas, we also want to look, okay, how can this drive precipitation? So for example, in a simple model system where we've got sodium, phosphate, magnesium, and chloride, if you heat it up to 95 degrees, you get such well, lamellar structure, uh, structures which contain sodium, magnesium, and phosphate. If we expose the same solution to our heat flow chambers, we were able to see that we get different kinds of precipitates. And also, locally, we found some new brides, so pure magnesium phosphate. And finally, at the moment, we only use kind of upright thermal chambers because it's easier to use, it's easier to build. However, if you look at a natural system of pores, of course, not all fractures would be like that, but most of them would be tilted somehow. And so for this purpose, we built a nice small setup, which we can just tilt on all the kinds of angles and then check, okay, how does this affect the pH gradients? How does this affect the ionic gradient? So here it's just sodium chloride solutions. And we saw that up to 30 degrees already pretty flat kind of it doesn't affect neither pH gradients nor soil gradients. For the H pH gradients is particularly interesting since normally it's more vulnerable to fluctuations in the systems. And only at 15 degrees 
it starts to decrease, but still there are pHs and there is a, an ionic gradient. And at zero degrees, of course, nothing is going on anymore since co the convection rules break down and thereby no material transport happens. And with this, I'd like to thank the mass group and also Brown groups and all the people who collaborated on the different projects I showed here. And I'd thank you for listening and the organizers for having me. And are there any questions? And how to ah, here, yeah, stop sharing. I can't hear you. I'm sorry, I still can't hear you. Maybe now? Um, yes, uh, now it's perfect. Okay. Great. Uh, so thank you so much for your very interesting talk. Uh, I, I would have uh, one question. Uh, so um, if I understand well, uh, heat flows are, are needed to obtain uh, the ion concentration ratio, ratio needed for, for ribosomes to, to perform their, their functions. Uh, and so I'm, I'm wondering if, if the heat flows itself aren't uh, affecting somehow the, these biological systems you are, you are considering, uh, except of, of the effect on, on the uh, ion uh, of movement, of course. That's, that's a good question. Yes, of course. We're Chain, like we're also co accumulating the ribozyme, which makes it go to the environment where we've got the higher salt contents. And of course, also the temperature changes slightly. However, we ran, like for that project, we ran checks at all different kinds of temperatures and also tried different, because normally the alternative to accumulating by heat force, you could just say, okay, let's dry down our solution. Because you also increase the ion concentrations. However, mm -hmm. by drying down, you don't get rid of the sodium, but we also try drying down with different starting volumes, different uh, temperatures, different everything. But yes, of course, we also derive us and react to the heat flows. Okay, okay, thank you so much That's for the answer. Question. Okay, <clears throat> uh, so thank you once again for, uh, for your talk.